ladies and gentlemen. I have a bunch of stuff here. I don't want to drop. Welcome to the 2000, was it three, 2004 Science Technology Society Lectures. My name is Terry Bristol. I'm the president of the Institute for Science, Engineering, and Public Policy, and it's the institute that uh, organizes the series. Um, and it's now my pl I want to say thank you to the co-sponsors. That's my role here at this stage. Uh, and our lead corporate co-sponsor was Mentor Graphics Corporation, and then Oregon Episcopal School, Oregon Public Broadcasting, <clears throat> Oregon University System, that's through the Chancellor's Office, and then Portland State University, Western Oregon University, University of Oregon, Oregon State University, and then the uh, Community College Consortium, which is uh, Portland Community College, Clark College in Vancouver, yay, good. <laughs> uh, Lynn Benton Community College and Mount Hood Community College. And then I also thank you to our underwriters, uh, Morgan Stanley Funds and IDC Architects. <clears throat> and then also uh, a lot of the students who are here, and I know there's a bunch of testing going on so we didn't get as many people out tonight, but there you go, <clears throat> they'll miss out. Uh, but anyway, Mentor Graphics Foundation gave us a grant this year to uh, supplement tickets for K-12 teachers and students. Thank you to them. Yes. It's my paraphernalia on my laptop there. Um, okay, so, um, and what I want to do here real quick then is I had promised those of you, and we're going to do more next week, but uh, see if I can do what I got, what I'm supposed to be doing here. God knows what's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> those of you regulars, you know, I've been saying there's this the wonderful thing happened. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the wonderful thing that happened. And this relates, what it is, is uh, a guy named Julian Voss Andre came to me. He's a physicist uh, out of Germany doing buckyballs and wave particle stuff. And he, he also background in his life is he was an artist. And so he had gotten into <clears throat> making sculptures of molecular structures now that we understand these I'm sure some of you have seen these pictures are really amazing well the first guy who figured out how a biomolecule the structure of complex biomolecules if you have salt like sodium chloride it's really you know pretty easy to see the structure but when you have something like C23H42 and you know 18 it's sort of like well yeah great you know what it's made of but what how is the structure well it was Linus Pauling was the first guy who uh, who figured out the structure of a protein and that structure, one of the very, very basic structures found very, very commonly, it had to do with his work on hydrogen bonds, how hydrogen bonds uh, 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 are involved in the structuring of these large molecules. Anyway, first protein structure, and it's something called the alpha helix, and it was cited in his uh, uh, awarding of the Nobel Prize in 1954. And since our offices are in Linus Pauling's boyhood home and so forth out on 39th and Hawthorne, uh, Julian, anyway, came to me and said, I want to do this sculpture, and long story short, I said, okay. So this is just a real quick, we're going to do something more next week from Friday when the next lecture is, yeah, but this is, I promised something tonight, so what the heck. Um, I have to do a couple of things here, and I have no idea. I think I'm going to do this without music, if you don't mind. You want the music? No. You want the music? <laughs> no, wait a minute. Right, we're getting sound. I guess we're getting sound out of here. We'll dog do some music. The question is, what music? I don't know if we ever guns and roses. <laughs> I'll tell you what I was going to do. I mean, I don't have much on here that was. I was going to do this, and everybody told me not to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Are you ready for this? No. Oh, wait a minute. I messed it up again. Hang on. Just give me a second here. You don't like Celine Dion? No? Well, turn it way down, Michael, when it comes out. Talk over the top of this. Here we go. So the first thing is the, that you're going to see here, oops, as soon as it comes up. Ah. No, this is wrong. So <laughs> that was from my high school class reunion. <laughs> that was not the right one. Okay. This will be right. Oops. Oh well, we'll go with that music. This is a this is the sculpture. It started out as a 12 
uh, inch by 12 inch uh, beam and Julian cut it and then re-welded it. This is, we're putting in the, this thing weighs 1,200 pounds and it's straight up, so we needed a base. So there's the structure, steel structure in there. And these guys, this is uh, Anderson Construction who did this whole thing for us for nothing, which is like, I don't know, several thousand dollars work and they just very cool guys and very much appreciate it. And the moment they were involved, it was like, we're working with professionals. We were really paranoid about what we were gonna do with this huge thing. And they're just like, you know, leveling this thing out. And this is in, this is between 39th and 40th on Hawthorne, Southeast Hawthorne, north side of the street. That's Linus Pauling's house in the background there. That's the next door. That's uh, Julian. He's put his handprint in the cement and stuff. Now that's the sculpture, that's after we powder coated it. And that's Julian down at the powder coaters. And you'll see there's a, next shot, there's a, see the base, we have this base circular and that's what the pins are on and how we, so we had to lift it down on these pins that are embedded in the concrete. Uh, and at 1,200 pounds, it's just, it was just a monster. So we got it with a lift, forklift and everything. This looks like it was really easy, but it wasn't. So that's the alpha helix structure that you see, anyway. And that's why everybody, if you've ever seen the DNA thing, the movie, and you know, why didn't Watson and Crick, and they always talked about the old man, they were afraid the old man was gonna get it before they did, well that was Linus. And the reason was, is that Linus understood, was the first one to understand how these uh, proteins folded and so forth. And there are various stories that if he hadn't had his uh, uh, passport jerked because he was, uh, against atmospheric nuclear testing, for which he got a second Nobel Prize, but if, in the meantime, if they hadn't done it, you know, that's Julian with the, he finally got it. Uh, Linus would have uh, got the DNA structure too, and you never would have heard of Watson and Crick. That's uh, Anderson Construction, guys, thank you very much. Dave Gilmore, these great guys. Randy did a fabulous job, and this is the guys that were hoisting it. I can't remember the name of the company. We'll do more next week, but they're great. Doug Strain, who's uh, in the front of your deal, who, uh, has uh, made the Linus Pauling project possible from the beginning. Uh, great guy. And that's the thing. It's in your program on one of the pages there, what that says, so you can read it. <coughs> champagne. Uh, more champagne. Anyway, there it is on Hawthorne. I'm shooting from the Pauling house there. Then we had to have an official unveiling. <laughs> so we veiled it up, and we got uh, Jim Francesconi, uh, he was a city councilman, and Jim knew Pauling when he was at Stanford and had, you know, encouraged us all along on this, so we invited him to come out and give a little pitch, and he's a politician, so he had something to say. And we unveiled it. And that's the Pauling, that's Linus's boyhood home in the background there. His, the window just to the left there of the sculpture is where Linus Pauling had his first laboratory. No girls allowed. <laughs> anyway, it turned out it's really beautiful, and when the lights on it, the shadows and everything, it's just incredible. So you guys have to go out and see it. And this is uh, Julian and his wife and his uh, mother-in-law and father-in-law from came over from Germany and so forth to see this. And, very happy guy. His wife is uh, getting an MD, PhD up in the medical school. Uh, very nice, Adriana. So that's it. Cool. So we theoretically have a, uh, a video of some of this stuff next week that we'll bore you with, maybe or maybe not. Also, actually, Oregon Art Beat, if you ever watched that on OPB, uh, did a thing. They followed Julian from the very beginning of this thing when he had the, the whole deal, and they are... Uh, I don't know when that's on, but it's going to be on soon. Uh, Seriously? Tomorrow at 7? Okay. <laughs> Do you really know for sure? Okay. Tomorrow at 7, uh, uh, Oregon Public Broadcasting. I didn't know. There. Oregon Public Broadcasting. There's a whole story of Julian doing this and the people that were involved. And it's been just, I've had a lot of fun with it. Anyway, so I need to get out of here because now uh, Maynard Orm from Oregon Public Broadcasting is going to, do this and I have to get my computer out of here so that George's computer will work. And so it's now my pleasure to introduce Maynard Orm, who's the 
President and CEO of Morning Play Broadcasting. Thank you very much. You know, when I was watching Terry do his thing, I was just reminded of Kojak and his great line, who loves you, baby? <laughs> Thanks, Terry, for your passion for not only the ICEP series, but for what you bring to not only the work of Linus Pauling and everything you do for the city of Portland. Thanks so much, Terry. It's great. Great guy. <laughs> Welcome to the next to last ICEP lecture for this season. It's a pleasure to introduce George Johnson, a New York Times science journalist since 1995. His Tuesday work with the science section in the New York Times is frankly my favorite part of that paper. He began as a staff editor for the Times Week in Review section in 1986. He currently lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico with his wife, Nancy. In addition to his writing for the Times, he is a multi-published author of many intriguing books, including In the Palaces of Memory, how we build the worlds inside our heads. Fire in the Mind, Science, Faith, and the Search for Order. And his latest book, A Shortcut Through Time, The Path to the Quantum Computer, published in 2003 by Knopf. This book is hailed as the first one to prepare us for the next big breakthrough in the short history of the cyber world. Born in Fayetteville, Arkansas, he moved with his family to Albuquerque, New Mexico when he was six years old. After graduating from the University of New Mexico in 1975, he freelanced for a year before working for the Albuquerque Journal as a copy editor and a police reporter, before returning to school to get a master's degree in journalism and public affairs in 1979 at American University in Washington. He then migrated to the Minneapolis Star as a special assignment reporter. Clearly a man of great curiosity, Mr. Johnson has traveled extensively with many of the world's great scientists and is a fount of information and stories about these people. He loves to explore boundaries such as, is science only a set of myths in which quarks, DNA, and information fill the role once occupied by gods? Or put another way, where is the border between science and religion, accident, or timeless law? Acknowledged as one of the best science journalists writing today, please help me welcome George Johnson as we peek into the palace of memory inside his curious and inventive head. Thank oh, thank you all very much. If, give me a second here while I hook up my quantum computer. I'll give you a run through. It's really a pleasure being in Portland for this series. This is just really something very extraordinary that Terry's put on for many years now, and I don't know of anything really like it in the country. I, when I was here last time, I did this when Fire in the Mind came out, and I think 1995, and I didn't get to see much of Portland then because of what I realized has come to be called the ice storms of 1995, and I was stranded in the airport, and well, they tried to figure out how to de-ice airplane wings, which I guess isn't usually an issue, but um, it was so nice this morning because Terry didn't have anything scheduled for me, so I took time to walk around downtown and went down to Pioneer Square, and it really struck me that Cinco de Mayo is a much bigger deal here than it is back in Santa Fe. Another thing that impressed me was just walking around Pioneer Square, I noticed this very, very nice looking young woman who was walking down the street, very well dressed, with a book just held out like this and just completely wrapped in what she was reading. I figured, you know, it was probably a tourist guide or something like that. And then I, you know, walked over so I could look and see what the book was, and it was Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow which is about, nothing could hardly impress me more. I tried to read this book with no great success since I was about 20 years old. And it's one of those books where you get the feeling if you could really make yourself read it and get through the end that you would undergo some sort of transcendent experience. Like maybe your mind would fuse into a quantum computer and you would solve unsolvable problems. But this doesn't happen everywhere. Um, I gave a talk on this a couple of weeks ago in another 
city that's really nice to, well, we'll get the clock back for. <laughs> Another very beautiful riverside city at the confluence of two other rivers, Pittsburgh. And you know, it was quite a surprise to me how very nice Pittsburgh is. And it wasn't a surprise at all how very nice Portland is, because you always hear that. Um, when I was in Pittsburgh, one thing they scheduled me to do that you just never really know. Sometimes you get these schedules and then you open them up and you see what they have planned. But after I gave a talk on quantum computing at the um, local science museum, I was appearing at a theater downtown and after uh, playing a movie called Run, Lola, Run, I was supposed to discuss the significance of the movie along with the local filmmaker. And you know, this seemed like a very dubious proposition. And I was surprised while I sat there and watched the movie for the first time, actually, that it was really a great way to, uh, when you're really hitting the subject cold, it was a very nice intro into some ideas in um, quantum computing. So, one thing I noticed, the resolution of this projector is different from mine, so I have to adjust something here. I know what we'll do, get rid of that. I'm just going to run the trailer in the background while I tell you a little bit about the movie. Some of you might have seen this. It came out five years ago, and it takes place in Berlin. And it's about, uh, there's this unsavory character named Mani. This is his girlfriend, Lola. And um, he's kind of a small-time hoodlum and has a job working as a uh, courier for a drug dealer. And um, This is a movie about time, obviously. <laughs> and um, the movie begins when Manny calls her up on the telephone, quite, quite frantic. He's you know, just really very, get the right one here. Ah, there it is, clip one. So, so Matt Manny is very, um, very desperate because he's just, I guess the sound's not, not coming through, which is fine because it has subtitles anyway. But he just uh, lost the 100,000 Deutschmarks that he had picked up from um, the um, people who were buying the drugs and can move it forward. So here he is relating his, his, uh, what his day was like. Dear... This is what I did today. He's arranging for these cars to come in. He gets the drugs, acts as courier, brings it to this guy in some big greenhouse they call the Cyclops. He approves it, pays him 100,000 Deutschmarks, and now, at this point, Lola is supposed to pick him up and uh, whisk him off on her motorbike. But it turns out that her motorbike was stolen earlier that day, so he's there all by himself. He panics, looks around. There's not even a phone booth, he says. This was before they had cell phones, apparently. He runs down, gets on the subway to go home with this uh, bag of $100,000 worth of cash. And then this bum comes walking onto <laughs> the subway, falls over, and then he tries to help him. And then he sees these, he, he has obviously a problem with authority figures. So he sees these transit guards, and he quickly sneaks off the train, suddenly realizing Oh my God, he's left the money on the train. The bag, the bag. <laughs> now, he's not the only one who realizes this because he's desperately trying to break back into the train and then the bum sees him out the window and goes, hmm. <laughs> Moment of dawning awareness. <laughs> now, this immediately begins Lola's run. And the story is that she has 20 minutes to um, reach Monty, or he's going, to, he's so desperate, he's going to pull out his gun, go across the street, and rob a grocery store where he figures he can get the 100,000 Deutschmarks. And she's trying to talk him out of this. And she says, if she'll, he'll give her 20 minutes, she'll be there and she'll somehow get the money. And she doesn't know how she's going to do this. And, but she's a very, very confident young woman. She's probably not someone who read, uh, read Thomas Pynchon on the street. But so she. Um, 
So he's already getting his gun out, getting ready to go across there. She's trying to talk him out of it. And now she thinks, how am I going to get this money? So she's watching the clock, thinking of all the people in her life who might have this money. And, you know, it's a pretty small subset of the public. And she's spinning around and thinking who, who, who. Different faces come up. And then finally she settles on her father, who's coming up here any second. Dad. <laughs> Back to dad. <laughs> Who you can tell is going to be very sympathetic. He's a banker. So she immediately gets out, starts running out of the apartment. This is her, her mother on the couch. We'll skip over her. And she starts running down the stairs until we now soon will reach a pivotal moment. Just down, it's like an Escher drawing almost. I really like that. Okay, this is the pivotal moment. She sees the bully on the staircase with the mean dog. And she kind of hesitates for a moment <laughs> and then leaps past and goes on her way and starts the adventure. And what happens is very much now dependent on how, her t how the timing went and the fact that she was um, interrupted by this guy on the staircase. So so first, yeah, this is, I put this in red because this will be important. She meets the bully on the landing and hesitates. And now, you know, the movie unfolds. And you still don't really know what's, what's happening. She brushes past a woman with a baby carriage, ac runs across a bridge, passes an American Express office, passes a flock of nuns. And, and uh, she darts in front of a car pulling from a driveway. The, the driver turns out to be named Mr. Meyer. He barely misses her. And then he hits a, a van full of thugs and, you know, gets beat up. And then she runs into her, f her father's office at the bank, where it turns out that he's talking to his mistress. And uh, she's been telling him that uh, you know, she wants him to leave his wife. And then he, she drops the bombshell. She says, well, I'm pregnant. And he looks at her. And she says, well, we, do you want to have the baby with me? She sa he says, yes, I do. And it's this very touching moment. And then Lola bursts in. And her father's obviously not very happy about this, because she's coming to ask for this money for her drug dealer boyfriend. So he goes into a rage, throws her out of the bank. She runs and finally gets to the, you know, where Monty is in the phone booth, but he's already crossing the street, going into the store, robs the store, and this results in a big shootout and Lola is killed. So this is 20 minutes into the movie. And then what they do is they rewind it back to the beginning and they show how the life, her lifeline could have unfolded very differently if only um, she hadn't met the bully on the landing. And in this case, the second time, actually, she not only meets the bully on the landing, but he puts out his foot and trips her. And this throws off her timing just enough that during the rest of the sequence, she doesn't just brush by the woman with the baby carriage, but actually bumps into her. And, and again, she's uh, almost hit by Mr. Meyer pulling out of the driveway. But she's delayed just enough, so when she gets to the bank, now, the, the father's mistress has a few more minutes to talk, and she says, after the father agrees with loving eyes that he's be happy to have the baby with her, she says, even if it isn't yours. <laughs> this is the point now where Lola comes bursting in, and obviously, you know, the father and the mistress are in this terrible fight, and then Lola immediately sees that her father is two-timing her mother. Now, this time, she goes into a rage, and to make a long story short, she grabs the guard's gun, holds her father hostage, and makes him um, get 100,000 Deutschmarks from the bank vault, puts it in a plastic bag, and she goes running to stop Manny before he goes across, you know, and, and makes the big mistake of robbing the grocery store. So this time, she catches him just in time, and Manny looks at her in disbelief as he sees her, you know, coming toward him, carrying the bag of cash, and then an ambulance runs over and squashes him flat as a bug. <laughs> so another poor solution. Finally, one more. They run this all through again, and this time, when she gets to the bully 
and the mean dog, she just jumps right over him and continues on her way. Her timing is completely different now, and she gets to the bank before the mistress has told the father that it isn't his baby, so he's happy. And it turns out that Mr. Meyer, this time, is coming out of the driveway at the exact moment she crosses in front of him, and he hits her, but doesn't injure her. She's kind of up against the windshield and delays him just enough so that he doesn't crash his van into the, his car into the van of thugs, and he gets to the bank, and it turns out his whole purpose in life is to pick up her father to take him to lunch. So just as Lola reaches the bank, her father's leaving with Mr. Meyer, so she knows she can't get money from him. And then she ends up running into a casino, and in this pivotal part of the movie, she puts 100 Deutschmarks on 20 black on the roulette wheel. She wins. She puts it down again and even more improbably wins again. She has all this money. She comes and you know, runs to Mani, and it turns out that you know, everything's different. So what does that have to do with quantum computing? Well, you know, the way in physics <laughs> they talk about this, let's look at what they call a tree diagram. And we can imagine these are the three stories of how Lola's life could have unfolded that day and each one of these these nodes is different things that could have happened, you know, depending on, on the timing. And, um, and of course, none of this would have happened if Lola's motorbike hadn't been stolen before the movie began and she wasn't there to pick up Monty in the first place. So, of course, we could imagine this diagram extending, you know, way back into where, um, you know, before she met Manny and even before she was born and Manny was born. We could extend it more and more to when life first began on the Earth or when the Earth formed out of the swirl of the solar system. And, you know, ultimately, you could go all the way back to the Big Bang. And let's say this is the Big Bang right here. Now, um, at the Big Bang, there's all these different ways that the universe could have unfolded, and we could think of these as all the different possibilities of, you know, how it could have happened. We might have ended up with, with uh, 10 planets around, well, maybe we do have 10 planets, but 10, of, uh, an extra planet that we, um, you know, between, say, us and, and Mercury, or, or we could be around a different star or not exist at all. So all of these possible histories are possible worlds. And the Big Bang, when it started out, was basically the size of a subatomic particle, you know, smaller than an atom. And really, in the current way of thinking, it's just a quantum fluctuation, a little random event that jostles the initial particle in such a way that it explodes and follows one of these paths. And, and one of the big mysteries is that there seems to be no way to really say that scientific law can tell you that one path would have been preferred over another, that the timeline developed so that we're all here listening to this lecture instead of maybe being held in a prison camp somewhere, or, or, a, or a timeline where people never evolved on the Earth or the Earth never existed. So there's an interpretation of physics that argues that the best way to really think about these is if all these paths actually do unfold. And some physicists call this uh, 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 many possible histories, and these are each different ways you know, the universe might have unfolded. And then other physicists talk about it as though these all happen at the same time. They're parallel universes. They're each sealed off from each other. So like with Lola, it's not just a matter of you know, seeing three stories of what could have happened that day, depending on what the bully did at the uh, stair landing. But all three of these things actually happen, and there's three different... different uh, and of course, many more than that going on of all the ways her life or any of our lives might have unfolded. Each one of these is sealed off so that uh, you know, we don't really know about it. Now, in quantum computing, we're talking about a computer that's made of parts so small that each one of the um, components that does the calculating is the size of a single atom or a single subatomic particle. So it obeys the strange kind of quantum mechanical, mechanical um, behavior where you can 
where you can talk about it, one way to think about it is that anything the atom can do, there's all these various possible branches, and that all of this kind of happens at the same time in this weird quantum, quantum way. And it's though we saw all, all three of the Lola movies going on at the same time. Now, imagine if you could do three calculations at the same time with the same kind of quantum parallelism, and you just start to get, you know, the rud rudiments of the idea, you know, of what's going on here and what they think is possible and have shown to some extent is possible. For example, there's currently a $200,000 prize for somebody who can, using a computer, a regular computer, can factor this number, <laughs> which is 617 decimal digits long. So how long would it take to factor something like that? Well, you know, the, um, basically the, all you can really do is sit there and first try dividing it by, well, you know it won't divide by two because it ends in an odd number, seven, but, you know, can you divide it by three? <laughs> so you try three, five, seven, 11, and of course, by the time you try all the factors up to everything that's, you know, almost as long as that number, even with a very large supercomputer, this would take so long that right now, it's essentially impossible to factor this number. And some of you probably know a lot of the coding schemes that are used to protect information on the internet are based on the impossibility or the effective impossibility of factoring these really huge numbers. If you start getting to a number that's, say, hundreds or even thousands of digits long, you'll commonly hear scientists say that it would take the most powerful computer in the world, oh, you know, t 10 trillion years to factor it, just these incredibly large amounts of time. Because the longer the number is, like every time you add another digit to the size of the number you want to factor, the time that it's going to take to try all the possibilities goes up exponentially. So it's uh, basically an unsolvable problem. Now, imagine though, if we go back to our, uh, what I was calling the tree picture, the tree of life picture, imagine that each one of these is a calculation that's unfolding and one spawning other calculations and each, there's all these different paths that are trying all of the factors at the same time. Now the promise of quantum computing is you can do that if you make computers so small that they're made out of single atoms doing the computing. We'll get to what that means. Um, this is currently considered the second fastest, most powerful computer in the world. This is in Los Alamos, New Mexico, just kind of up the mesa top from, from Santa Fe. And uh, this is called Q. It's named after, they told me, the uh, character in Star Trek. And <laughs> it recently replaced a um, computer called Blue Mountain. And this one was already a quarter of an acre in size. So it's still like on, I think, the top 10 list. Um, and just to put that in perspective, like, you know, my laptop here, or almost all of our laptops or computers have a single high-speed processing chip. And each one of these chips is made of a million, I mean, many millions of microscopic transistors. Each one of these basically processes ones or zeros, which we all know is the, is the code that computers calculate in the simplest form of arithmetic, where anything is either just one or zero, and you string enough ones and zeros together and you can calculate anything. Now each, for, for Blue Mountain, which has been surpassed, each of the 384 of its cabinets contains 16 of these chips. So this is like it has 6,144 processors all running at the same time. So we can kind of think back to uh, you know, all the Lolas running through the world through different paths, and these, instead, of, instead of that, it's these computers doing simultaneous calculations. These are, this is a, not a quantum computer, and we'll see the difference in a minute. And uh, you know, they, when they describe these computers or take you on a tour, they love to, it's like people talking about their cars. You know, this thing has 500 miles of fiber optic cable connecting all the, all of the cabinets and uh, 1.6 megawatts of electrical power. So it basically takes the equivalent of half a ton of ice just to keep this thing from melting down. It performs three trillion 
calculations a second. So now, shortly after they built this, the computer scientists at Los Alamos had an experience that we've all had where you just you know, buy this great new computer and then a year later it's hopelessly outmoded. And the kind of problems they're running involve so many calculations that they were trying to simulate one millionth of one second of a nuclear blast for some research. And this took so much number crunching that it was um, basically it was four months of just the computer running constantly to do that many calculations. So this is kind of why they moved on to Q. Now, Q is like seven megawatt calculating factory, which is basically the size of, um, you know, so it's enough power to run a small town. It's an acre in size, and uh, it's rated at 100 or 150 trillion operations a second. So uh, that many calculations happening every second of every day that it's running. You know, sometimes like any computer crashes and has to be rebooted. Now, I was visiting this computer for another story I was doing for the Times when I first heard about one of the first quantum computers. And it's, this is just right practically across the street from where they were building Q. And there were these two, two young physicists working on this. And they've made um, a quantum computer that consists of, it's just impossibly tiny. I call it little Q. It's basically seven atoms strung together. It's a molecule. And, and uh, working with some chemists, they synthesized this. And how can that be a computer? You know, it's, uh, oh, thanks. So how can that be a computer? It's, um, we said that a computer basically deals with ones and zeros. So in a normal computer, like a Pentium chip, you have, say, 14 million microscopic transistors. Each you can really think of without oversimplifying too much as a switch. It's either on or off, representing one or zero. Now. With an atom, it can be in two different states, which we can, just to simplify, we can call up and down. So if you think of an atom, that's, if it's pointing up, we just say this represents a zero, a one, and if it's pointing down, it represents a zero. So if you have a whole string of these like this, you know, this represents a long binary digit. And of course, one advantage is that it's uh, extremely small, but more than that, we have this quantum parallelism that I was hinting at before, where things can happen at the same time. So we have our up-spinning atom, our down-spinning atom, or it could be a subatomic particle, just anything small enough that it obeys the weird laws of quantum mechanics. And according to those weird laws, a quantum particle or entity can uh, spin up and I mean point up and down at the same time. And the reason for these, these rotating arrows is this isn't really an important point, but uh, I just took this out of my book. And you know with the top, if it's spinning in one direction, say clockwise on its axis, and you can define, you know, this, this part is the top of the top and this is the bottom of the top. And then if you flipped it over, it would be spinning in the opposite direction. So really what's happening is these atoms are spinning either clockwise or counterclockwise, and you call this pointing up or pointing down. But the main thing to remember is that they can be in two states, and one is just said to represent one, and one's said to represent zero. So in quantum computing then, instead of having a transistor representing each of these states, you have an atom. So I think you know, the significance of that comes clear when you think really about how a computer does its computing. This is actually a picture of the, the ENIAC, which was the first supercomputer built in the 1940s. And I just love this thing because it's made, these are all vacuum tubes. So instead of having um, microscopic transistors like in a Pentium chip, here we have each vacuum tube is either on or off, representing a one or zero, and it fills a whole room. And this thing is, um, it's 150 times less powerful than my, my laptop here. And um, 
and with transistors you go down another level, but now we're going down another level, so, I mean, even though the transistors on a Pentium chip are so tiny, each is still made of a billion atoms, and now we're talking about going down to um, the size of one single atom, you know, do, processing a one or a zero. Now, another take, and this is another way to get in. What I'm trying to do here is kind of back into what a computer's doing and what it would mean to make it, make it quantum mechanical. This is actually my first computer that I got when I was, uh, I think it was in the second grade. It was uh, this advertisement I saw in Boy's Life magazine probably. It says, can you think faster than this machine? And it promised that if you sent 1995 to this company in New York, they would send you a computer kit that could do all these amazing things. So this was the Geniac, and, and I you know, made it very clear to my parents that this was absolutely what I had to have for Christmas. And I was delighted to see that I got it the Christmas morning. I opened it up, I was very disappointed. This is basically what it is. I found one of these on eBay recently and took a picture of it. And, you know, it's, as you can see, it's just a bunch of light bulbs and mechanical parts and nuts and bolts and these little, little brass kind of staple-like things that you stick in the holes of the wheel. And then you bolt this thing together, and basically it's just a bunch of complicated switches. So, you know, to say that I found this disappointing would be a vast, vast understatement. But then when I started really, <laughs> this is just so 60s. Uh, Geniac, simple electric brain machines and how to make them. And this is basically, I came to realize all a computer was. You can see the back of it here. You know, it's just wires and switches, little circuits that can be on or off. You know, the little Geniac wheels are basically doing what a transistor, or what a vacuum tube and then a transistor would later do, and now possibly single atoms. So, and you could do all kinds of great things like this. Like here was the schematic diagram for the reasoning machine. <laughs> And again, I just realized, you know, this, when I was looking at this, once I overcame my disappointment, was that really that's what a computer's doing. You're putting these switches into different positions, turning circuits on and off, processing ones and zeros, and it really doesn't matter how complex the computer is. You can take something that's, say, as complex as all the computers on the Internet hooked together, and that's all that's really going on. You could take the whole internet and replace it, in theory, by a really, really complicated Geniac machine and have people twisting around all of these little dials. So, in fact, you could even make one out of Tinker Toys. And this is, there's actually, could the Tinker Toy, if it's, if it's pushed this way, it can be a one. If it's pushed that way so it's not there, it can be a zero. And, you know, it represents ones or zeros. So, in theory, you could represent any string of binary digits with a bunch of tinker toys, and you could imagine contraptions, which they've actually done, where you could um, make tinker toys do little computations, like <laughs> this is a, what they call a, uh, an OR gate, some of you may know about in, in computing, where basically the idea is if input A is one or input B is one, then the output C will be activated. So. You know, input A is one just means you push the tinker toy spool on the top, you know, to the um, right, and then, or you can push this one, and either way, it'll push this little spring-loaded gizmo to the right. And in theory, there's nothing that Q, the great supercomputer, can do that you can't do with a bunch of tinker toys. And as far as I know, the most sophisticated tinker toy was done by some MIT graduate students back in, I think, the 70s. This is all made out of Tinker Toys, and it plays tic-tac-toe. <laughs> and flawlessly, there was an article about, well, flawlessly in that, in theory, it cannot lose a game because it has the perfect strategy just programmed into it by how you arrange the Tinker Toy parts. But in, in the, the mechanics weren't so good, and you know, often they'd find that it would jam up and they'd have to, have to restart it. Now, when I was trying to get into the idea of quantum computing for the first time, I began to try to think of it as if each one of these was like a tinker toy that could be in two positions at the same time. It could be one or zero. It could be in this weird quantum juxtaposition. 
And then the question from there was what you can really do with that. And it's worth emphasizing that once you get down to the size and the tiny spaces inside atoms, I mean, basically, all this sounds you know, completely absurd, but the ordinary rules of reality just don't hold. So we could have this one and zero spinning atoms up and down. So for the moment, if you take this on faith, that the strange ability for an atom to point both up and down, to say one and zero at the same time, can lead to these most powerful computers imaginable that would make, you know, solve in seconds problems that would take something like Big Q that takes a, an acre in size a billion years. It's like a million Lolas doing calculations all at the same time. I'm talking ahead of my notes here. Now, how this works, <laughs> sort of. In, you know, so if we have one atom, one quantum switch that can simultaneously be in two positions, right? One or zero, up and down. Now, if we have two quantum switches, they can each be in four positions. I mean, first think of just ordinary tinker toys. We could have one if we had two tinker toys, depending on where it is, it could be representing a zero and a zero. It could represent a zero and a one, a one and a zero, or a one and a one. Now with two atoms, because of this quantum schizophrenia, they can be in two positions at the same time. So all four of those numbers can be represented at once. And then it goes up exponentially. We add another Adam. Now, if these were tinker toys, we could arrange three tinker toys to represent eight different strings of binary digits. If they're atoms, however, they can be in this quantum state up and down at the same time, and we have eight numbers at the same time. And, which doesn't sound like much, but as you can see, it doubles each time you add an atom. So with four, you can do 16, five, you can do 32, then 64. By the time you get to a string of 10 atoms, it's two to the 10th power, 1,024 numbers that can be held by 10 atoms at the same time. And if you're representing these numbers like this, you can think of ways to manipulate the numbers and do a little calculation. So suppose you wanted to take a square root of every number between one and 1,000, or really one and 1,024. You could just load them all at the same time on a row of 10 atoms, and you'd perform a single calculation and I'll we'll talk in a minute how you do that, then you instantly have all 1,000 answers. And it just goes up faster from there. With 13 atoms, you can do 2 to the 13th, or 8,192 calculations at the same time, which uh, is more than Blue Mountain can do. And then to get to uh, the next level, a computer as powerful as Q, you just add one more atom, and then it doubles again to 16, 384 calculations all at the same time. So this is what's theoretically possible. You can have a computer that's invisibly tiny, and it's as powerful as this. So we go back to our factoring problem. Remember, we can get $200,000 if we can come up to the, with the factors of this number. And even if we had access for many, many centuries to the power of the supercomputer Q, we couldn't do it. But we go back to our tree of simultaneous whirls happening at the same time. Each one of these is like a calculation trying out one of the many possible factors. You know, over here we're dividing it by two, and someone else is dividing it by three, and another calculation's going on. All at the same time, kind of unfolding, just like this many worlds thing with these, uh, it's just like all these parallel universes, and in each one, one of the calculations needed to solve this problem is going on. And it turns out that a scientist named Peter Shore at Bell Labs proved in 1995 that um, with a quantum computer, you could uh, solve basically in seconds, a, uh, or probably fractions of seconds, a, a factoring problem of that size. 
And if you had a few minutes, you could factor numbers that were thousands of digits long that would take any conceivable supercomputer not using quantum mechanics longer than the universe will probably exist. Just the amount of power you can get into the small space because of quantum mechanics, it really, it really just, this has just really floored me when I did the back of the envelope calculations. But you add a few more atoms and you get up to where you have 64 atoms, which is still, you know, so tiny, it's, it's you know, invisible. I mean, the period at the end of a sentence in a book has, has billions of atoms. So this thing could perform two to the 64th power calculations at the same time, which is 18 quintillion, which is a trillion repeated one million times. Yeah, and then uh, for a supercomputer like Q to do that, to make it perform that many calculations at the same time, considering it's the current one is an acre in size, you'd have to multiply it by what turns out to be 700 trillion times. So it occupies 750 trillion acres, which is roughly a trillion square miles. So basically it wouldn't fit on the Earth. You know, you'd need like 5,000 Earths to fit a conventional non-quantum computer as powerful as Q. Or you could use like a single molecule. Now, my colleague John Wilford at the Times spoke on a science writing workshop that uh, a friend and I do in Santa Fe every summer. And he was kind of giving the classic form of a science story for Science Times. And it's kind of true for a, for a science lecture that you start out by making all of these just really amazing extravagant claims. And, Actually, in a news story, you do this in the first few paragraphs, and then you start kind of taking them back a little, one by one. And um, the caveats are that this is just barely, barely beginning. In theory, it seems to be possible, and these people at Los Alamos took seven atoms, and they made a little computer out of it, and a lab at Stanford got a seven atom computer to factor the number of 10, the number 10, and the answer was two and five. So, <laughs> to everyone's relief. But uh, <laughs> I wrote a story about that for the Times, and I was just trying to convince my editors, you know, yeah, this is really a big deal. You know, they factored the number 10. You know, and he says, oh, well, yeah, two and five, right? <laughs> but the thing that was great about this is that it proved in principle that it was possible to compute with atoms, to take a little string of these things and manipulate them in such a way that you could solve a factoring problem. So I called up Peter Shore, the guy who had written the paper proving that a uh, quantum computer could factor numbers exponentially faster than a regular computer and ask him how many atoms you'd, ha you'd need to do that. And he said, actually, it would be something in his estimation of about 2,000 atoms because in addition to in addition to the atoms that are doing the computing, holding the ones and zeros, you have to have a lot of error correction and redundancy. So if it makes a mistake, so for every one atom doing a calculation, you have to have maybe nine more that are, that are there kind of monitoring its behavior. And then you have to monitor the monitors. But still, 2,000 atoms is, in, is, is an invisible size, but it's quite a leap to scale from the seven that they're doing now to thousands. And the big question now is whether they're actually going to be able to do that. Now, the, the um, state of the current technology, it was interesting at Los Alamos to see this experiment and go in there while these two scientists are sitting there like at a regular computer terminal and monitoring this quantum calculation. Because as you can imagine, atoms are so small and so delicate and to preserve these quantum states, you have to go to extraordinary measures. So a quantum computer actually operates in its current form only uh, at very near absolute zero. So it's cooled by liquid helium. So you have this computer that's invisibly tiny, and yet it's surrounded by this huge room and several million dollars worth of um, cryogenic equipment. And then, so it's representing the seven little atoms seven little ones and zeros. And then to do the program, they actually 
they, they hit this thing with uh, high frequency radio waves and each, uh, if you think of this row of atoms, depending on, on the nature of the molecule, each atom in the molecule will resonate to a different frequency. So it's kind of like, you know, you've seen this trick they do sometimes in shows where they'll have a row of bells and each one is a different size of bell. And then if you play a, a tone on a piano or a horn or something, one of those bells that's you know, tuned to that frequency will resonate. So you can address each one of these atoms this way in this quantum computer. You hit it with a radio frequency of a certain you know, it's very exact frequency, and then just certain atoms in the string will resonate, and if you hit them for just the right time, a zero will flip to a one, or a one will flip to a zero. And then, by the, the way the molecule is synthesized, say if this one flips up, this one over here will have to flip down, so there's little interactions between these. So, to come up with the software then for this hardware, they send, they come up with a sequence of pulses that will manipulate the atoms in just such a way that the ones and zeros will be processed and it will, you know, perform a calculation like factoring numbers. So, but can you go from seven to 7,000? And can you do it without doing it at absolute zero? Another thing that, it, it, when you can build one of these, and most of the people I talked, I mean, no one knows, but they'll say, maybe in 50 years we'll have something that does something interesting enough that it's not just toy problems like factoring 10. But it's still only been proved that this gives you this huge advantage in certain problems, and the really most remarkable one is factoring, which is very important because of its use and security. But, um, there's a lot of other problems that it's still completely controversial and even doubtful that a quantum computer would give you that kind of speed up. But another one, another Bell Lab scientist uh, named uh, Lou Grover, or Love Grover, wrote a paper about the time that Peter Shores came out proving that a quantum computer could give you a very significant speed up in how long it takes to search a database. So, um, and of course, a database could be anything from your your company database to the entire internet, and, and you can do it um, um, quadratically is the word, faster than you can do with any conceivable non-quantum computer. And this isn't as good as a exponential speed up, but so far these are really the only, only two problems that they know for sure would, um, would result in this huge, huge advantage. Now, for all of these caveats, though, you know, the reason that this remains so exciting is what's been proved at this point is that nothing in the laws of physics rules out the possibility of a quantum computer. And, of course, there's a lot of things in, possible in theory that never, you know, come to fruition. But this is, you know, the people that I talked to, like uh, Manny Nill and Raymond Laflamme, the two young scientists who were working on this quantum computer at Los Alamos, this is what just really really excites them. The fact that they've proved that you can go down, manipulate atoms at this quantum level, and you can solve little toy problems, and that there's no reason that they can see nothing that, there's no law of physics that says you can't do this for, you know, on much larger scales and have this incredible computational power. And one final caveat, we've been talking about all of these simultaneous calculations on our tree here as though they're completely independent parallel universes where, you know, one is sealed off from the other. If I can get this back. Ah, that way. And it's, you know, it's true, these parallel paths, you know, whether they're someone's life unfolding in all these different ways in the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, or if it's all these independent calculations they're basically sealed off from each other, and yet what makes this different from like a parallel non-quantum computer is that there's a certain amount of interference between the paths, and they, they affect each other in really, really subtle ways. So, one way to think about this that I found easiest was, you know, you imagine two waves in water coming together, and if one's slightly out of phase with the other, you know, they can cancel 
cancel one another out. And in a similar way, all of these calculations going on at the same time kind of interact and some cancel out others, some reinforce others, and you finally, finally converge on the answer. So as far as the implications of this, I think I'll leave that for, uh, for our question, question and answer period. You can ask me about you know, specific things and I can tell you what, you, what I know about that. But uh, the basic story is that this is actually exponentially less powerful than that. Thank you very much. Oh, I guess there's three three microphones. Yeah, one oh, one above, and yeah. So if you just uh, yeah stand at the at the microphones. And... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right here. <laughs> yeah, the blue cards. Put the question on a blue card. There, whoa. The blue card and and the ushers all critically possible, like from the scientific standpoint, to actually. Put these to make these atoms work together in like these two thousand atom arrangements in the quantum, like in in math in real terms. Is it? Uh, I'm not sure. I understand. It, it's. I mean, it, it's possible theoretically, according to the the papers and the research and quantum theory. But uh, you know whether and, and it's been shown that it's possible to do it with say seven atoms. But uh, whether that can be scaled to thousands of atoms all being manipulated in this very delicate, precise way at the same time is pretty much an open question. But only, it's an engineering question, whether we're, you know, we, we're clever enough to pull that off, but you know, not whether it's uh, possible in, in theory. Is that? Uh... Uh, uh, you were talking about um, an atom being like up and down. That, that's what determines if it's like either off, on or off. What exactly? How how is it? How how is the state of an atom determined? Like what what is it? What determines whether it's a one or a zero atom? Oh well, that's really arbitrary. I mean, just as it is in a non-quantum computer, you can make a computer and say that uh, if a switch is on, this means one, and off means zero. But the computer would work just as well if you if you defined it oppositely and said, uh, you know, switch that's on is zero. And and just as long as you have something that can be in two discrete states, and you can say this way means one and this way means zero, then you can take these little objects and use them to form computations. And it doesn't matter if the objects are transistors or vacuum tubes or tinker toys or single atoms. And then the difference being with single atoms, you get these quantum states where they can be in two states at the same time. Okay. Yes, I can't I can see, see out too well because of the light, so. I, uh, you were talking about the, uh, the seven atom uh, computer at Los Alamos. Yeah. How, how large a uh, piece of equipment or how large a laboratory does that take and uh, how large would it be if they made it into a 2,000 atom computer ah, today? It might not be any larger, really. It, it takes up a, a kind of a large room. In my memory, it was about the size, maybe, of, a, of someone's garage. And, and the technology they use for this is called NMR, or Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. And it's um, the same technology that you use if you go to the doctor and, and he orders an MRI scan for you. And it's a way they use high frequency radio waves to kind of vibrate your little hydrogen bonds and the molecules in your body. And someone realized a few years ago that the way he put it was, well, it's sort of like we already have a quantum computer because we have these NMR machines. So they figured out a way to um, take a liquid in which you dissolve a whole, you know, many trillions of these little seven atom molecules, and then, and then you put them inside the NMR machine, in which uh, basically suspends it in a very intense electromagnetic field, and then they start shooting the little you know, individual pulses of high frequency radio waves that manipulate the atoms. So you know, this is you know, millions of dollars of equipment, takes about a garage size thing, but 
you know, it's not really the size of the atoms that matter, so it's uh, theoretically possible, I keep using that, these weasel words, theoretically possible, that, you know, if you go from seven atoms to 2,000 atoms, that's still an, an invisibly tiny speck, and it might not take any more support equipment, but the big hope is that they could come up with a way to do this with solid state, so it wouldn't have to be at absolute zero, and, and basically the quantum computer now is a liquid, the one that I'm describing, which is a very strange thought, but uh, if you could do this on a chip, and there's a technology called quantum dots, and it's a kind of a tiny little spot on a chip, which is so small that, say, it's like a, a little corral, and there can either be an electron in there, or the electron's not in there, and zero and one, or since it's quantum, it can be zero and one. Now, so far, a lot of people think that if they can get to, um, to making these little quantum dots, and, um, you know, this is, this is really the path that's going to lead to a quantum computer that you might actually be able to build and solve currently unsolvable problems. But they haven't made one even with seven quantum dots yet. So the one with the nuclear magnetic resonance technology is the state of the art currently, but very few people think that that's going to um, be scalable or that quantum computers, if and when they occur, will look anything like that. Okay, thank you. Over uh, here, m m you mentioned that computer security is based on now uh, the impossibility of factoring these really huge numbers. Mm -hmm. Well, if this came into uh, fruition, what would uh, what's the implications for computer security? Ah, yeah. Well, this is that's a very interesting question because when this field really took off, this was first suggested. This idea of a quantum computer by, uh, among others, Richard Feynman many decades ago, and it was just kind of a toy thought experiment that physicists talked about, you know, late at night when they, you know, went out drinking after a hard day's work at Caltech. But um, then Peter Shore wrote this paper showing that a quantum computer could actually do something that you couldn't do otherwise. And, and at this point, the National Security Agency, which is the, um, you know, the main code-breaking and keeping agency for the federal government, became intensely interested in this possibility of quantum computing, if for no other reason, because you know, they want to be sure the United States has it before someone else. So they imagine you know, the nightmares of some scientist down in his basement laboratory building a quantum computer and figuring out how to crack all of the nation's or world's codes. So is the, way, the way it is now, since you know, we were talking about factoring numbers, and you, you have a 500-digit number, and then you add one digit to that, and it's not just trivially harder to factor than a 500-digit number, but it's exponentially harder. So now, whenever a computer is powerful enough that they can crack, say, a 500-digit number, you just use a 1,000-digit number for your, your encoding scheme, and then it's impossible to crack. But you know, with the quantum computer, each time you add an atom to the string, its power goes up exponentially, so you can quickly outstrip the ability of any government agency to use this as a coding scheme. So they'd have to come up with a different way to encode information. And interestingly, one of the ones they're talking about, they've had some advances in, is quantum cryptography, where you use the same kind of state of quant you know, quantum mechanics where things can be in these ambiguous states, one and zero at the same time, and they figured out how to devise a cryptography scheme that would um, be uncrackable, essentially. And, and that's like, I, I have a chapter in that in my book, but it's almost like a whole other subject. And for some people in the field, this is, it's likely that quantum cryptography is going to become useful long before quantum computing is. There's actually already been experiments where they've sent a quantum encrypted message as far as about 40 miles on, uh, on a fiber optic line. So it doesn't take this intense cooling that quantum computing does right now. Thank you. Uh, my question is, you had mentioned that the atoms uh, exist in both states at once. So if they exist in both states at once, how does one read the output? Ah, yeah. yes, that's, that, that's the single best question probably that anyone could ask about quantum computing because that, you just hit the nail on the head. And that was, again, one of the very 
difficult breakthroughs was coming up with a way to do that. So let's say we have our, our string of 1,000, uh, our, our string of, um, of 10 atoms holding two to the 10th power, different numbers at the same time, and which is you know, approximately 1,000 numbers. We zap it with you know, high frequency radio waves or laser beams or something, so it flips the atoms up and over, and it performs the square root calculation. So we end up with um, the square root of all 1,000 numbers hovering there in quantum superposition all at the same time. You know, this doesn't seem to do you a lot of good, but the simple way to get an answer out would be um, you measure it, you, you disturb the quantum system, and then it collapses and it loses its quantum quantumness, so it just takes on one answer, and it'll randomly give you one of the 1,000 answers. So that doesn't help too much for that example, but say you're, go you're getting the factors of some incredibly large number, hundreds of digits long, you load it into a string of atoms, and then when you're done with the calculation, all of the factors for that number will be there in quantum superposition all at the same time. And then you just read the system, and in a, the quantum juxtaposition breaks down, and one of the answers comes out at random. But, you know, there's probably only going to be two or three factors for the number, so you have one of them then, and then you can run the calculation again, and chances are, next time when you measure it, it'll give you the, um, give you the other factor, so. Thanks. Uh, oh, Peter? You're looking over there. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just need a little clarification on this. Um, most of the uh, current digital computers today use a variant of the uh, von Neumann architecture. And I'm kind of curious, I can understand how you, you can use atoms to say state, but are you proposing some sort of a uh, analog or digital process to this? Because most of the computers use a, you know, a discrete set with instructions a bus that connects yeah. memory to ALU. Is this? It's it. it what, what I've been describing. It's it's discrete in the sense that uh, you know we're still dealing with with ones and zeros, and we're dealing except with the exception that we're dealing with these weird quantum states where something can be one and zero at the same time. But uh, a lot of that's kind of depends on how you interpret what the quantum computer is doing. Like I know some people working on this. Um, there's this guy at Columbia named Joe Traub and, and Seth Lloyd at MIT, and, and um, they really make the case that, this is a, that a quantum computer is more like an analog computer than a digital computer, but I don't, haven't quite been able to understand just what they're getting at, and it seems like it has a lot to do with just how you, how you interpret you know, how the computation is going on. But you're right, it would be very different from a von Neumann kind of architecture. A von Neumann architecture is like all of our computers now basically are doing one calculation at the same time, and it's just very precisely coordinated, so it's all funneled into one processor. And in a parallel computer like Q, you have many of these von Neumann single processors going on in parallel. But, so a quantum computer is a different, different architecture, that's true. Can you tell us where to get a copy of your very cool clock? <laughs> yeah, let's see. Um, it's called Industrious Clock, so uh, I just found it, found it on the web. Somebody told me about it, and, and I just downloaded the Java code, and I had to adapt it a little bit so it would run without being connected to the internet. But if you go to Google and search for Industrious Clock, it'll pop right up. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I want to uh, follow up on the question that the fellow who is standing right here before me asked. Um, if I'm, are, are we then saying that these quantum computers are only going to work on one problem at a time? Because if they were working on multiple problems at a time, then they would be simultaneously solving all of these problems at the same time. And then when I went to get an answer, I would get an answer to some problem, but I might not know if <laughs> it was the actual problem, problem that I was working on. So, and hence, you know, 42, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that's true. I mean, it, and part of the answer is, is why 
these things they think can only be used for you know certain kinds of problems. And with factoring, I think it's you know that that would be okay because if the problem is to get say the what turns out to be the three factors of some some uh, ten thousand digit long number, and you get one of those. You know, you, and if there's only two factors, then you automatically have the other because you just divide by the one. And if you run, and then you just run the calculation a second time. If you get another one, you know, you, you have another factor. So, but I could get the same. In theoretically, I could get the same answer yeah, over you could. and over and over again. Until, yeah. So yeah. you have actually replaced but, but if you the a thousand computing times, issue so. with a selection yeah. issue. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's true. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's true too. So, um, I mean, there could be some d l very long number that has just an extraordinary number of factors, and it's highly unlikely. But um, yeah, you wouldn't know, would you? It's a good point. Yeah. Um, uh, exactly, or well, according to everybody's best guess, I guess. Um, about what is the computing power of the human brain and about what kind of a computer would be required to simulate the capabilities of, of the brain. You, you hear a lot of different speculations on you know, the computing power of a human brain. One, one thing, you, you used to hear that a, a human brain consists of uh, approximately one billion neurons or brain cells and then at some time recently, people started saying a trillion brain cells. Uh, no one's ever counted them, of course, so they do these statistical kind of guesstimates of how many neurons there might be. So, you know, one answer would be if you thought of those each as a computer processor, like a, a Pentium chip, but, you know, we don't know enough about the brain to know if that's what we should think of each neuron as, or is each neuron just more like a, you know, single little, little uh, one or zero memory cell storing one digit. I mean, some people argue that a single neuron has the computing power of one of today's supercomputers. So I think it's really impossible to make a, make a meaningful comparison. Conventional computers are built with uh, uh, logic gates such as AND, OR, and so on. I'm wondering what kind of gates we would require to build quantum computers. The, the kind of gates? Mm -hmm. um, it, it was, you know, there's a kind of gate called a NAND gate and not... Yeah, not those, are, those are conventional logic gates. Yeah, right, and um, there, was, there was a paper that was written a few years ago that proved that you could build a quantum computer. Uh, that, that was the universal quantum gate so that any other quantum gates could be made, made from that. Actually, it's an XOR gate. Yeah. Right. I, <clears throat> I've been hearing a lot about uh, reversible gates may be required to build yeah. quantum computers. Well, yeah, rever there's, um, you know, one of the interesting things about a computer is that it's basically what they call irre irreversible logic. So, for example, if you walk into somebody's office and you <coughs> pick up their pocket calculator and it says 10 or 42, Let's say 42. You pick it up and it says 42, and you have no idea how the 42 got there. You know, they might have, just before they put it down, they might have punched in 6 times 7, or they might have punched in 45 minus 3, or 4200 <laughs> divided by 100. There's just any number of different ways you could get this, and once you do the calculation, that's just discarded. The information is kind of shed off and, you know, dissipates as heat into the atmosphere. Uh, with a quantum computer, it's been proven that it has to be a reversibly logic, a reversible logic, so you can always, you know, follow back and forth. I mean, this gets into some real esoteric computer science, but, uh, and, and before they really were thinking much about quantum computers, some scientists like Edward Fredkin came up with ways to build a reversible logic gate, and they're actually uh, drawing on some of these, these designs and, and when they try to uh, come up with their blueprints of possible quantum computers. Thank you. How does one of these computers store information for a future calculation? It, let's say a mm. 
project requires many calculations, how does it store between one another? Yeah, I haven't heard a good answer to that because it seems pretty clear that uh, you know, these things are just very, you know, very, very volatile. So once you got an answer, and what, what's, the, what's talked about a lot is using quantum computers with ordinary digital computers. So, you know, once you got, um, got an answer out, you could, you know, store it digitally in a, in a more uh, permanent state and then dr draw on that number later if you needed it in the calculation. But uh, when all these simultaneous calculations are unfolding in this, you know, little quantum mechanical computer world, they're really exchanging information as they do this between the different histories. And that was this interference that I talked, talked about, which is, you know, just a whole, whole different aspect of this that I, I get into in the book, but I, it doesn't work too well in a popular lecture. But all these paths interfere with each other, and in such a way it's like they're exchanging information, or there's little bits of information leaking between these simultaneous histories. So in that sense, they're like storing and you know, moving information in this very rapid time. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, isn't it uh, atoms rotation that decides uh, whether it's going to be, a, whether there's a one or zero in quantum computation? Yeah, it's, it's the atoms, uh, the rotation, so like a top, if it's um, rotating clockwise, you can say it's pointing up, and then if you flip over the top, it's going counterclockwise, so you say it's zero, so. So, so what if uh, the requirement is like a zero, zero, or one, one, so it means that two atoms will be rotating in the same direction, isn't it uh, kind of defying the chemistry laws? Because I, if I'm not wrong, two atoms cannot rotate in the same direction if they're in the same shell or in uh, the same yeah, well, if all their, yeah, if all their other quantum numbers are the same, right? Um, but if it's, two, atom, but if it's uh, two atoms that are side by side, they're in different positions, I think, so doesn't that? Yeah, but the short answer is I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, I, since the beginning of the computer era, which I came in on just a little bit afterwards, um, we have had computer errors, glitches, that emerge randomly, spontaneously, that uh, have caused us glitches throughout the end of time and now the blue screen of death, of course. <laughs> what happens when you get glitches or randomness or odd results in these massive amounts of computations? How do you identify the spurious, corrupt uh, variants of answers? Mm. Yeah, and this too was, these are just such great questions because that was really one of the fundamental breakthroughs. People argued for years that if you could make one of these quantum computers, it would be so prone to error. And how could you find your error? Because um, you know, one of the corollaries of quantum mechanics is that all of these weird juxtapositions only happen while the atoms or molecules are in complete isolation from their environment. And once you disturb them, it all just collapses into some random form. So you have to keep the little tiny computer in this, uh, you know, the very isolated state. So the only way you can tell if there's an error is to disturb it somehow and say, well, is this one here a one or a zero? And once you do that, you've ruined your computation. So. Um, again, it was Peter Shore, this guy at Bell Labs that came up with, the, I think he was the first, I, they argue about this, um, but he came up with a scheme in which you could exploit some of the nature of quantum mechanics to, um, if, if you know the term entanglement, where you can have one atom that's quantumly entangled with another, and he was able to show that you could come up with an error correction scheme like that where you could... Um, detect that something was in the wrong state and then change it back to its correct state without actually knowing what state it was in. It's <laughs> I finally, you know, th this is the hardest chapter in the book and I, you know, it's one of these things where if I look at it now, I don't understand what I wrote. But for a while it all came together and this light came on in my head and I sort of saw what he was talking about. Yes, se several entangled bits, yeah, quantum bits for each one. So the way it was described to me by Shore was that 
And that's why he was saying, as I, I said earlier, that um, I asked him how many atoms he thought it would take to factor a really, really, really big number, and he said probably, you know, maybe 2,000. And uh, then I think later, you know, the number kept going up the more he thought about it. But, and this is because of this quantum error correction. Each one of your little, little atoms, your, they call them qubits for quantum bits. Um, each one of these has to be entangled with several others for this error correction scheme to work. So, um, so that, that's why you have many more, uh, you know, on paper it would seem like you could do this problem with 100 atoms, but it would actually take thousands. Yeah, um, during your talk, uh, well, during the questions here just a moment ago, uh, you were talking about how an atom, uh, depending on the direction it spins, can uh, represent a value. But during your talk, you were talking about uh, how an atom, a single atom, uh, can actually perform a calculation. Uh, can you tell us a little about the mechanism for that? Oh, well, um, I mean, a single atom could be it could, be, it could perform a calculation in the sense that you could have it be one or zero or one and zero, and, that's, and that its state could affect another atom because they're, they're entangled somehow. So that's all I meant by a, a single atom or particle being able to do a computation. But, so maybe that's not the right word. But you know, you know, with two or three, then you can sort of you know, see how you could manipulate enough patterns to you know, do some little simple problem, and then with you know, 100 do something more. Does that? Yeah, I think that answers it. Very quickly, have these two fellows at Los Alamos published a paper? Uh, yes. Yeah, there's several. Uh, yeah, if you search for, um, for, for uh, NIL, K-N-I-L-L, Manny, Manny NIL, you know, it's an easy Google search because there's not many people named that, and I'm sure his web page will, will pop up with, with links to the papers. And, Thank you. Uh, from your perspective, uh, the difference between parallel computing and quantum computing is that in parallel computing, you have multi-calculations done without any of each affect the other. But in quantum computing, you have multiple calculations done with each calculation affects the other. Yes, in this, in this quantum mechanical manner. Um, what, one analogy that they use sometimes is, you know, again, you know, each one of these calculations with another metaphor can be thought of as, as a wave of a different frequency and a different phase. So if you imagine all these calculations as, you know, different waveforms going out, and then they kind of come together so that some interfere and, and cancel each other out, you know, the troughs of, of one wave matches up with the peak of another, and it just disappears, or you could have two of them coincide so that they reinforce each other or just change phase a little. And at the end of all of this, it just kind of conspires so it comes out with the waveform that's the answer. As uh, just to um, add uh, to one of your previous answers, uh, entanglement means when uh, the calculations that are done that are superimposed with each other, that you cannot decompose uh, that calculation into primitive, uh, primitive answers. Otherwise, it's called uh, non-entangled. Is it's called otherwise what? Non-entangled. Non-entangled. Yes, because you can decompose the answer into uh, a sum or multiplication of primitive answers. Ah, right. So it's, but, so, so it's li linearly yes. decomposable. Yes, yeah. but so if it's not decomposable, we call it entangled. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a good way to put it. I hadn't okay. thought of it like that. Okay, actually, I, I got two left, okay? You said they were trying to go to silicon, and was there any kind of projection, five years, 10 years? Yeah, I mean, not really. I mean, you know, of course, there's no way to, you know, prediction is always hard, especially of the future. Okay. <clears throat> and then, and, yeah, <coughs> the, the, other, the other thing that kind of goes on is, um, you know, one of the early techniques that they, they teach young math students is, well, guess at an answer and then use, you know, pick a, a methodology and it will co eventually converge. 
Um, is the speed such that we're liable to go back to that sort of, you know, let's just try everything and see what works huh. sort of? Yeah. yeah, I think I see what you mean, but yeah, I just don't know. That's, that's an interesting thought, kind of an irony. Well, thank you so much. Oh, yeah, I might need that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good question. As I understand it, uh, you could do this quantum computing on any number of mechanisms, uh, electrons, various molecules, yeah. and that. Which brings up, could you do it with uh, Schrodinger's gas? <laughs> well, yeah, actually, there's this lab in uh, Boulder, Colorado that's run by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST as they call it, and they do a different quantum computing experiment from the one I described where they have a single ion, you know, a charged atom, and they have it in a vacuum and it's suspended in a magnetic field, and I think they've gotten up to two of these, you know, each one of these being a one and zero or one or zero quantum register. And they do an experiment they actually call Schrodinger's cat, you know, where the claim is they have this atom that's spinning, um, spinning uh, clockwise and counterclockwise, pointing up and down at the same time. And they call it a, you know, a cat preparation. It's, I mean, it's not alive or dead, but it's supposed to you know, be the same thing. So yeah, you know, you know, there's just all different kinds of things people have proposed. There's one guy at, um, again at Bell Labs, who's come up with a design for a quantum computer in which the objects doing the computing would be uh, electrons floating on a surface of, uh, of superfluid uh, helium or something. So, but, you know, it's just on paper at this point. But you couldn't do with Parallel question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you read about quantum mechanics, you Problem, yeah. Does, does, does quantum computing shed any light on what this collapse of the wave function is or this measurement problem is? And where, at, at what level does it occur? How do you protect a quantum system from the environment? And what are you protecting it from? Yeah, no, that's, and there's something very arbitrary about deciding what's your system and what's the environment. And uh, that's a very, very good point. And I mean, the first part of your question is no, I don't think anything in quantum computing, as I understand it, really answers that question of, which is basically, if we're all made out of these subatomic particles that behave according to quantum mechanical rules in this weird thing where something could be in multiple states at the same time, how is it that, you know, what emerges from this or, you know, this world we live in, in which it seems very clear that you know this can be here or this can be there, or this can be here and there at the same time, and and uh, no, I, I think that's. I mean, some quantum physicists that I talk to, most of them I don't think worry about it so much. It's just sort of finally at this point they just say it just doesn't translate into words or common sense, but it's there in the mathematics, and then. The ones I consider more interesting, you know, really grapple with this and try to. But I, I think it's, it's a pretty good consensus that, you know, when you get to questions like that, it's a matter of interpretation and how you interpret quantum mechanics into words, and and then it uh, kind of gets almost into metaphysics instead of physics, which seems a little, you know, kind of a cop out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. In, in terms of that, just sort of following on with understanding quantum mechanics, have you had a, an opportunity to see the movie that's playing here in town, What the Bleak Do We Think, which is about quantum mechanics? No. Uh, what, what is it called? It's called What the Bleak Do We Think. No. Yes. Oh. And it's playing over at the Baghdad, and it was actually filmed so, in that theater, so it's kind, oh. of, it's kind of fun. Wow, so is it like a local independent production? Uh, or? I think 
Fred Allen Wolf. Oh, uh, oh yeah. David yeah. Albert. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Some of the real guys. far out uh, physics guys. Oh, I'll, I'll look for that. <laughs> that sounds great. Maybe we can see it before you go. Oh, well, sure. Oh, yeah, if you get an opportunity, it would. Oh, it thanks for mentioning that. I think it'd be great. Yeah, maybe I can write about it. Yes. Uh, what's the significance of a quantum leap in quantum mechanics or quantum uh, computing? Or quantum leap. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, this is the idea that say. You know, the real, the real simple metaphor where the, the electrons in one orbit are stayed around the atom and then it, and it could jump into the next higher state by this discrete amount, but it can't occupy any of the in-between positions. Now, I, mean, I guess it's significant in the sense that that's part of why you can do the computing since so something can be in this discrete state. So like something in a lower orbit could be said to represent zero and then in a higher orbit, it could represent one. So that's kind of what they do at the NIST lab, where they trap a single or two, two um, ions, and then they, and then they, hit them with little laser beams. In this case, and then if they bring it to a higher orbit, they say that this is the same as changing the zero to a one in a computation. <coughs> I've been taught that you can't know both the direction and the velocity of the electron, so how are we going to know where it's at to measure it to get data out of this model? Hmm. Yeah, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Well, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's true. That's one of the fundamentals. So how well I guess these these ions that they trap aren't actually moving in the you know, through space so you, so you don't have the position versus momentum problem, I think, but uh, I haven't really thought about that. That's, you know, all of this, anything with quantum mechanics, when you really start thinking about it, you realize that, you know. <laughs> There's an awful lot we don't know about. Yeah, right. The time is old quote was it. If you think you understand yeah, it, yeah. then you don't. Yeah. You haven't looked at it enough. You haven't looked at it enough. enough. He said, yeah, Feynman would say, you know, I don't understand it, and I'm this brilliant physicist. <laughs> Why do you think you should understand it? So, I mean, that's funny. The funny thing about being a science writer, and you know, I, I sort of follow science the way other people follow baseball. I think I just love it. I'm fascinated with it. I immerse myself in it. But I'm not a scientist. And, and you have the dilemma of where you're writing these books and articles about people who know vastly more about the subject than you ever will. And yet, you know, the hope is that your skill is that you can communicate it to other people using words and metaphors instead of mathematics in a way that most scientists are either not interested in or don't have the um, ability to do. There's certainly some, some major exceptions. Is it your sense uh, that the literature, uh, like the Penrose stuff about consciousness and you know how people think and all this sort of the physics of the brain, you know they bring quantum stuff into that? Yeah. Too. Yeah. And then over here you've got the quantum computing. I wonder if you sense any drift of convergence, whereas they study quantum computers more and more, they're going to use that as a mirror and try to put that inside and say, well, we do that in our heads anyway. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. I th um, I, I guess I wouldn't say I see, see any convergence because, you know, Penrose's theory that the brain works according to quantum mechanics, I mean, on the level that it's processing information and the, using I mean, quantum mechanics is basically saying the brain is a quantum computer. So, um, and, and it's interesting because, you know, Penrose is, I mean, he's a, he's a physicist. And so most of the criticism comes from neuroscientists who say, well, this has nothing to do with anything we've ever heard of to do with neuroscience and is completely irrelevant. And most of the physicists, Penrose's colleagues, aren't really particularly interested in the question. So, you know, it remains this very minority p opinion, yet with the acknowledgement that it's by someone who's, you know, one of the most, you know, the smartest, most accomplished physicists in the history of the planet. But, um, it's a neat idea to think that you know, we'd find out that we're really have these quantum computers going in our heads and that we're going to replicate this somehow. And yet, you know, we can't factor really large numbers just by looking at them. So, <laughs> yeah. I was intrigued by your comment that some people saw a close parallel um, with quantum computers with analog computers. Yeah. You know, I thought a lot about well, how how could you 
program the quantum computer for a specific kind of problem solving. And in that analog computer world, you actually make the computer architecture reflect the boundary position of the problem yeah. you solve. Yeah. And it seemed to me that would probably be the more effective approach. Yeah, that's actually that's exactly what some people have told me. They they've come to believe, like this guy I mentioned, Seth Lloyd at at MIT. Because originally, when Feynman came up with, you know, was playing with this idea, it was just one of a lot of things he was toying with. But he was saying that, you know, now if you take a system of like several subatomic particles and you try to simulate it with a digital computer, it's an intractable problem because there's, you know, it, it becomes exponentially hard and you quickly run out of computing power. So Feynman's first inkling was, well, what if you simulate this particle, these uh, quantum particles, with a quantum computer made out of other quantum particles? And it wouldn't just be a simulation, but it would actually emulate it. And, and, um, and he was saying, well, basically that way, you know, you could solve these problems. And, and some people like, like Seth Lloyd really think that the big breakthrough, and, and the first thing that they do that will really be impressive with a quantum computer will be able to use it to like simulate the behavior of 50 protons or something, you know, like in, uh, in uh, quantum chromodynamics. So. And it would actually be an analog computer in the same sense that you could you know, have a battery and a rheostat that was uh, you know, simulating some computational process. Is there any uh, relationship with DNA and quantum? Yeah, well, there's, there's, you know, you've probably read about DNA computers where they've you know, come up with uh, ways to use these chemical reactions to perform computations using DNA, but um, but, but it would be a non-quantum computer. It would be technically the same as a, you know, what they call a Turing machine, basically the model of any, any digital computer. So just like um, you could do anything with the Tinker Toy computer that Q at Los Alamos could do, you could do, you know, DNA computer could in theory do anything that Q could do or the Geniac or any other digital computer, but it wouldn't be fundamentally capable of performing a computation that um, that wasn't otherwise possible. So it's just another kind of non-quantum computers seems to be the general belief. Uh, any, I mean, you've talked about computation, but any thoughts about how the potential of these computers might be used in terms of storing data? Yeah, that's. Um, I mean, I think because of the volatility of, you know, keeping a certain quantum state across, you know, many different atoms, you know, you know, I don't see too many people talking about it as a storage, you know, where that really would be the advantage, although at first blush it seems like it would be if you could have like, you know, 10 atoms in theory storing, storing a thousand states, but, you know, most of what's been talked about I think is, you know, just this more you know, short-term thing where you're just doing the, con you're just storing it long enough to do the, do the computation. And but you, if you can store it for a short time, it seems you can store it for a long time. Well, yeah, I mean, but you have to maintain this, um, maintain it in this, you know, complete isolation from its environment, right. whatever that means. <laughs> and, um, you know, so just the slightest little disturbance, like a, a photon, you know, coming in could, you know, set the whole thing Things skew. I think I understand what the. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll get you next time around. Anyone else? Yeah. What are some other uh, areas of science that you're really excited about? That you know, right now I've been really getting in, in, uh, into history. And I was telling some people at the table here that I just finished the manuscript of a book about this period around 1920 when astronomers decided that the Milky Way wasn't the entire universe and that there were actually all these other galaxies. And I just found it just uh, extraordinarily wonderful that as recently as 1920, this was a matter of debate and, and astronomy. There was actually a big debate on the floor of the National Academy of Sciences where uh, Harlow Shapley the great astronomer was arguing that the Milky Way was the whole thing, and then this other astronomer um, named Curtis was arguing, you know, the opposite—that that there are many, many galaxies. And um, 
and it was, you know, very controversial position. And then they figured out, or think they figured out anyway, a way to measure these very large, large distances because of a discovery by a woman named Henrietta Leavitt at the Harvard Observatory. And uh, this was kind of leveraged by some people who came later into you know, our current view of the universe as being much vaster and the Milky Way just, you know, there being as many galaxies as we once believed there were stars in the Milky Way. So it's just been very fun to go back and try to recreate this like 20 year period of history and, and try to get across the notion of you know, how different the universe looked, you know, in say 1905 than it did in 1925 and how quickly that all happened. Back to quantum computing. Um, you mentioned there's only a handful of applications that, that uh, few people have imagined. Yeah, in even power less. Computing, there was also a period, but that has become richer, and there's a whole bunch yeah. of things that people mm. now know, although there still isn't a very good way of characterizing the kinds of problems yeah. that power computing. Yeah, right. How is, is there anything, can you characterize mm. at all the situation for quantum computing, problems that are natural for quantum computing? <coughs> the two that are interested in our database lookup and the, the number and then the number factory. Well, one that, that people are really wondering about is, you know, NP problems or NP hard problems, they call them. And these are problems that are of a class that now are considered intractable by any conceivable digital computer. These are things like sometimes you read about the traveling salesman problem where you compute the shortest. That's like effectively cracked, you know. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but not... Not analytically, right? I mean, you can come up with, uh, you know, as good a, an approximation no, no, no. as you it's, want. No, no, no. simplex, no, dancing and people like that, in the last five years, they're doing traveling tours now with 30, with limits like 30,000 cities, which was it beyond the realm. Yeah, but, but they don't claim that they could do it for an arbitrarily large number, do they? No, but 30,000 yeah. is so far beyond. Oh, yeah, no. I, you, know, you know, for all, pro yeah, it's been a, for a long time. You, you can take almost any traveling salesman problem you'd ever want to solve in the real world, like finding the shortest way to... All I was saying is using that as an example of NP complete is rapidly using its luster. Yeah, well, yeah, I've heard people say that, and I've also heard people argue <laughs> argue the other way, but, uh, but, but an interesting question would be whether an NP complete problem would be as trivial for a quantum computer as, as factory would be. And there was... Uh, a paper that came out a few years ago where, you know, the, we'll wait till the, <laughs> that uh, came out a few years ago that, you know, with, within, you know, certain predefined parameters of how they, you know, define the problem and define quantum computing, they, they um, came up with what's considered a strong case that a, com a quantum computer would give you no advantage on, on NP, P complete. There's been no progress since that time. Yeah, you know that paper? Yeah, so not that I know of. I mean, still, I talk to you know, quantum, you know, you know, people in quantum computing who will, you know, go through the paper with me and tell me why they think, you know, where they don't think it completely hangs together is completely definitive. But I've run across very few who really hold out hope that a quantum computer will, will be able to, you know, do, do um, those problems and, and you know, so they'd scale linearly. Could you briefly state the big problem like this? Well, you can probably do that better than I can. <laughs> it's, um, well, the classic example that we always use when we're writing about these things is the traveling salesman problem. And say you have a um, hundred cities on a map and you're a traveling salesman and you want to figure out the absolutely most efficient way that you can visit each city once and only once, you know, in the shortest possible path that will lead through all these points and there are these these uh, various methods that have come up over the years in which they can solve this and come up with just very very good approximations you know that are like a good enough answer as good an answer as you'd ever actually need need in, in real life and even apparently for like 30,000 cities as the gentleman was saying oh, I didn't know that but uh, you know and it's very very impressive but you know, the question is whether you could take any arbitrary number of cities, you know, whether it's a million or a trillion or just any number and figure out some algorithm or computational method that would help you find the shortest path in, you know, less time than, you know, 
the sun will <laughs> become extinguished. So, so, so that you could do it. So every time you add a city to the um, group that the problem would scale linearly. So if you had twice as many cities, it would take twice as long. That would be the ideal case. But if it's exponential, every time you add another city to the route, it takes exponentially more time to solve the problem. So it's kind of you know one of the holy grails, I think, in, in computation theory. And there's some people that you know hold out hope that a quantum computer would somehow be able to do this quantum mechanically, but it's very controversial. It, it sounds very similar to the, to the, the two or higher body problem of uh, classical Newtonian physics, that those problems quickly become unsolvable. You mean like the three three plus the body three problem? Bodies. Yeah, it is. It's a, as far as exponential scaling, no, I, I don't know if that's considered. Would that be potentially an application for quantum computing, you suppose? Yeah. I don't, yeah, I mean, again, it's, they, they don't know, it's just... just the problem with the, the, the body problem, mm -hmm. that's right, the round-off error issue. You're doing a simulation and you don't carry enough precision. Mm -hmm. The quantum computing does not address that. Yeah, so okay, good. All of these problems have the aspect that they're digital, that you have a discrete set of states. That works, those yeah. errors work. Yeah. The traveling salesman problem is hard because the number of states is enormous, but it's still a discrete set. Oh, you can't I get see. Caught halfway in I see. Yeah, right, right. The, the, the analog problem that you're talking about, that's a different issue. I see, that's a whole different, yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, the problem that the express, absolute precision, abstract equations, and I'm expressing them sorry. Yeah. 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 The equations express them, but you don't know, for example, if they alter the character that you change the starting conditions by an arbitrarily small amount over a sufficient long period of time, that will make an order one difference in the answer. So, for example, it was an idiot at MIT, in my personal opinion, who was going after this. He built a, a device to try to, he wanted to know if the solar system was stable, which is a pressing question in the minds of some, mm -hmm. and he was interested in trying to integrate the solar system. How do you know? And he built his computer, and what he discovered is what anyone knew beforehand is that small changes, and you measure the positions of the planets to the greatest precision you can measure, a tiny difference in the measured positions will, over the course of a billion years, make an order one difference in what happens. Wow. Therefore, you cannot, it doesn't help you. Makes sense. Which you get in the end, which is no better than the end. It's no better than the end. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, it's about the data. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. So, yeah, so. You've had the chance to hang out with all these physics, physicists. Yeah, that's the fun part. Could you tell us some anecdotal stories? The insights. Yeah, well. Pick somebody and tell us what they're Well, Murray Gellman, you know, I mean, I wrote a whole book about him, but. Um, I, my favorite, Mur you know, really when I decided to do the biography, I was in Santa Fe. I took a year off from the from the job at the Times because I was writing this book, Fire in the Mind, which is connected with northern New Mexico and science and physics in a strange way. And while I was out there, I was going to the Santa Fe Institute a lot. You know, they were studying something they called complexity. And um, at this one conference, I sat down at lunch and then kind of looked up and noticed to my complete horror that the great Murray Gell-Mann, Nobel Prize winning physicist, discoverer, or inventor of the quark, was you know, walking toward me with his lunch tray and sat down across from me at the picnic table, which was very terrifying because I'd heard stories about how intimidating Murray Gell-Mann could be. And he introduced himself, you know, very nice. and. So I'm Murray Gell-Mann. I said, oh, I'm George Johnson. And he asked me why I was at the conference. So I told him I, you know, working on a book. And then I mentioned that I, I worked for the New York Times. At the time, it was you know, on leave as an editor. And he says, oh, so the New York Times. And then he just kind of went into this tangent where he was talking about various uh, science writing in the New York Times that he had really, really disliked. And he mentioned one of my colleagues who, um, Dennis Story, had issues with, and then he mentioned this guy named, um, yeah, the late late William Lawrence. Um, he described him as a 
as a man of impenetrable stupidity, unmatched even by science writers today. <laughs> and uh, B Bill Lawrence uh, won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for breaking a story about something called the Manhattan Project. And he was one of the real respected names in our field. But, but Murray said, well, you know, this man was just so impenetrably stupid, he wouldn't believe in the neutrino, no matter you know, what, I, what I told him. And, uh, and it just went on and on like this. You know, I just kind of sat there and listened, and I thought, wow, you know, this guy's <laughs> a piece of work, as they say. And um, then I heard, this was the t during this time he was writing, or trying to write this book that later came out called The Quark and the Jaguar. And uh, I'd heard he, about the great difficulties he was having getting this book out the door. So I said, oh, Murray, I hear you're uh, writing a book yourself. And then he just kind of went, oh, well, <laughs> and kind of changed the subject. And, and um, later, you know, so we had some run-ins like that. And later we became friends. And I just decided, you know, for years I wanted to write a scientific biography, and I didn't know of whom. And then I thought, well, you know, here I am in Santa Fe, and I'm writing this one book, but, you know, I should observe Murray Gelman while I can, and then um, and then think about doing a biography later. So, you know, after the other book came out, I approached him about this, and he basically refused to cooperate for about a year. And I just kind of made it clear I was going to write it anyway. You know, I said, well, you know, most most people, <laughs> most biographers are writing about people who are already dead. You know, there's all kinds of stuff in records, and you can interview people. And at some point, he, he just you know, kind of decided it would be wise to have some input into the project, I think. So he, um, for a while, was very cooperative. I met with him well, about once a month for, I guess, a couple of years. I got, you know, maybe more than a dozen hours of interviews with him on tape. And then finally, right toward the end, and I just kept bugging him because I knew he had these great archives in his garage at his house because his secretary kept telling me about them just many, many, many cubic feet of all the correspondence he'd engaged in since like 1950-something when he was you know, at the Institute for Advanced Study with Oppenheimer. And I kept trying to get him to let me see this stuff, and he was very reluctant to do so. And then to my complete astonishment, one day in a weak moment when he was about to leave for a few months on a sabbatical, he agreed to, you know, he said, oh, well, yeah, I guess it's okay. And then you know, he kind of left, but I looked at his secretary and he said, oh, well, you know, I guess he, yeah, he did say that, didn't he? So I got to spend the next month sitting in Murray Gelman's office at the Santa Fe Institute, and every day we'd go to his um, garage out at his house and load up a few boxes and then bring him back to his office, and I'd just sit there and go through these things and then photocopy what I wanted, and, and you know, he decided that was okay. and. Just, you get so much more of an insight into someone that you can get from anything. It was just, you know, things it, ranging from Robert Oppenheimer writing a letter to Murray's draft board telling him how it was very important for the war effort that Murray be <laughs> allowed to uh, stay in the United States and think about theoretical physics, to letters he'd exchanged with his, uh, with his wife, um, who, who died very tragically young of cancer, and just really got a and just things, too, where you'd heard the stories, like a, a um, dispute that he'd had with, uh, with uh, Lee and Yang, the, the two physicists who, um, you know, just you know, as, as important as Murray, really, in 20th century physics. And they had this bitter, bitter dispute where Murray was accusing them of stealing one of his ideas, and they called him on this. And, and you know, I'd heard the story from numerous people, and I heard Murray's version of the story, but then actually there's the correspondence, and you could see Frank Yang writing to Murray Gelman saying, you know, I heard what you said about us stealing your ideas, and you know this is untrue, you know, and you will apologize immediately, and, and he did. So little things like that that just, um, you know, just nice details or a f little bit of correspondence between him and Richard Feynman, who some of you probably know work just two offices away. There was like uh, the secretary, Helen Tuck, had her office here. Richard Feynman was here and Murray Gelman <laughs> was here. So she was like in between these, these two just uh, very contentious and very brilliant people. And it's fun talking to her too. She 
the world class gossip and just <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that's my favorite. Yeah, I mean Murray's just endlessly interesting, exasperating, brilliant person. We should probably wrap up the third. Yeah. Thanks so much. Boy, great questions. <laughs>